everyone. Welcome to our gospel service. We're going to commence now with our time of praise. And the first one we're going to sing is God sent his son. one we're going to sing is years I spent in vanity and pride caring not my Lord was crucified knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary let's sing this on to the Lord this evening <laughs>
one we're going to sing is here is love vast as the ocean loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life my ransom shed for me his precious blood one for our time of praise as I serve a risen saviour he's in the world today I know that he is living whatever men may say <laughs>
wonderful to have that time of singing praises on the Lord. We're going to commence now our service with an opening hymn. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. We'll all stand for opening hymn after the introduction, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for leading us in our praise tonight. Let's just bow together in prayer and let's ask for God's help and blessing for our meeting. Our God and our Father, we 
Thank you for the privilege again afforded to us tonight to come in simple childlike faith and to bow before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you that your word encourages us to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. We come to you tonight, the God of all grace, and we come in the Saviour's name, and we come, our Father, to give you thanks for this day, the Lord's day, and for all that we have already enjoyed from your hand. We thank you for able to meet this morning, and we thank you, Father, for those who were able to come and meet with us, and we thank you, Father, for the help that you've given and for the time that we have spent in your presence. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come back again tonight and to come sit under the sound of your word again and to hear the preaching of the glorious gospel of your grace. We thank you for the words we have been singing as our opening hymns and choruses. And Father, we thank you that there is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came into the world to save sinners. We thank you even though he knew that that would take him to an old rugged cross where he would suffer and bleed and die. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly came and he lovingly laid down his life for sinners just like us. And tonight, our Father, many of us know him as our Savior. We know the truth of the words we have just been singing. He walks with me, he talks with me along life's narrow way. Father, we thank you that there's never a moment of any day and never an experience that we have to come through that the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't know all about that and that he doesn't know all about us. In fact, our word tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ goes before us and so whatever we fear or face this week coming in, we thank you that we can put our hand in his hand and walk by faith and not by sight and know that the Lord Jesus Christ is with us and he'll always be with us for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we thank you, Father, for those who've been able to gather out tonight. We commend our meeting to you, the singing of your praise the reading of your word. We pray, Lord, for Mark as he does the announcements, and we pray for the preaching of your word. Father God, we commend everything to you, and we pray that this will be a good night spent in your presence. We ask our Father for those who meet here in the building and for others who meet with us live on Facebook, that God would be with each one of us, and Father, that you'd meet us at the point of our need. We realize right across our land that there are many other meetings just like this taking place in various churches. And Father, we pray that you would bless the preaching of your word. We pray that you'll bless those who handle your word, those who sing your word, and those who go out tonight to testify of the grace of God in their lives. Our Father, we thank you that in these closing days of grace, we have these priceless opportunities to make the Lord Jesus Christ known. But Father, help us not just to leave all our evangelism to a Sunday night. Help us to realize this week that every single one of us have been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to go out into the workplace, into our homes, into our schools and university, and to tell others about the love of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be faithful to our great commission. Help us, Lord, before these days of grace close to reach all that we can so that at least they may have heard the way of salvation. This is our responsibility. It is your responsibility to save. But we pray, our Father, that we'll be a people, individually and collectively, who are concerned about the souls of others. Bless, we pray, to our young people as they meet later on tonight in our youth fellowship. We thank you for it. We thank you for those who lead it. And we thank you for every young person who comes. And we pray that they too might 
have a good night of fellowship together. So these are our prayers. We come to you and ask for your help and for your blessing. And we pray that everything that will be done will be done for the honor and for the glory of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. I'm glad the pastor was praying for me giving the announcements tonight because I've left my glasses at home and I can't see a thing. So we're praying for sight tonight. But I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to your evening gospel service at Bambridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who are tuning in live this evening on Facebook. And if you're visiting with us this evening, we give you a special welcome. Pastor Taylor continues his series, Lessons from Dr. Luke, and the title this evening is The Pharisee and the Publican. After evening service, we have the Youth Fellowship over in the hall at 8 p.m. The announcements, the incoming week on Monday, the warm room continues from 10.30 a.m. through to 12.30 p.m. Then on Tuesday, the toddler group at 10.30 a.m., the Good News Club at 6.45 p.m. And then at 8 p.m. we have the Ladies Fellowship in the Church Hall and it's a making cards night with Jude McComb and the ladies have been asked to please make sure that they bring some scissors with them on the night. Cards will be available on the night for purchase and all ladies will be made very welcome at that meeting. Then on Wednesday our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. and that's with our elder Woody Price. On Friday, the Bible study at 12.15 p.m. and then the youth club in the evening at 7.30 running through to 9.30. Pastor Taylor is on holidays all this week, so if a need arises, please contact one of the elders. Then the next Lord's Day, the 10th of March, Sunday school and Bible class at 10 a.m., 10.45 our prayer meeting, and then at 11.30 our morning service and breaking of bread, and the speaker next Sunday morning will be Pastor Jeffrey Ward. Children's talk will be Letitia MacDonald, and children's church will be Woody and Elaine Price. The children's crash will be Julie Bird, Aaron, and Sarah Bowman. Then the gospel service at 6.30 p.m., and our speaker in the evening will be Mr. Johnny Price, and our singer, singers will be Brian and Ruth Agnew. That's all the announcements, and they're made subject to the will of the Lord. We were supposed to have a singer tonight, uh, but Hannah has phoned, she's not well, so we're going to stand ourselves and sing another hymn before the pastor comes and brings the word of God.
If I could read the announcements like that without glasses, I'd throw them away. And I'd just get up and do it without them. Now turn with me, please, tonight as we come to Luke's Gospel again, to chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we're going to read from verse 1. Just before we read these verses, let's bow for a moment again in prayer. Father, we're so glad that we're able to come and fellowship together tonight, but we realize there are those who'd love to be with us and they cannot. We think of the elderly, members and friends of our fellowship, and in particular we think tonight of those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We want to commend them to your gracious care again. Father, we thank you that you know about their situation, that you're the God of all comfort and the God of all grace. We pray for each of the families individually. Some already have attended funeral services. We think of Ruby as she buries her brother this coming Tuesday. And we just ask our Father for each of the families that have been mentioned already this morning, that God would draw near to them and God would encourage them. For those who are laid aside, our Father, just now, we commend them to you as well. We think of Anna over in hospital and we pray for your hand of restoration upon her. We think of Gareth and Alison, both recovering from surgery. And again, we pray for them that God will help them through these days and that soon they'll be back on their feet again. So hear our prayers and bless your word to us as we read it and as we meditate upon it tonight. Grant us your help, we pray, in the sea of your name. Amen. Amen. Now turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he that is the Lord Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And he spake this parable unto certain, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may remember that last Sunday night we thought of three words that were spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, remember Lot's wife. Three words, a short sentence, and yet it carried a very, very solemn meaning. 
Why should we think about Lot's wife? Why listen to some words of warning that we need to remember from the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, of course, he was speaking to the Pharisees, and the background to what the Lord Jesus said was all about judgment. The Bible tells us it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So none of us dare even think of the fact that when we die, that everything's over, we're put into Mother Earth, and that's the end of the matter. That's not true. It's appointed unto men once to die, and then after this, the judgment. And of course, the question, why should we remember remember Lot's wife, was upon our hearts. Firstly, because she was a woman who had enjoyed many great privileges. With her husband Lot, she had lived with Abraham. They had gained so much from his wise and godly counsel. Even when God said he was going to destroy the city of Sodom, they were warned about this coming judgment. However, it made no difference to Lot's wife because she did not believe. Secondly, she was a woman who had a great problem. Whenever Lot and the family left the sinful city of Sodom, Lot's wife had gone with them, and they were out of the city. They were actually near the place of safety. But Lot's wife's problem was that she had left the city, but she had carried with her a huge part in her heart, and it cost her greatly. The attraction of Sodom, and therefore the attraction to sin, prevented her from reaching the place of safety. She was a woman who faced punishment. She looked back. And the Bible says she became a pillar of salt. How tragic. How tragic that she didn't obey the directions, that she did and look back at a city that she should have left wholeheartedly to reach the place of safety. She was lost when the rest of her family were saved. Well, does Jesus say those three solemn words, remember Lot's wife? Tonight we come to these verses I've read to you here in Luke chapter 18, and we note the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And I believe that this is not just a very important parable. It's a parable that is very relevant for the world in which we live, and especially for this country in which we live. Because you see, there are many people who think like and act like the Pharisee, who think they deserve to be in heaven, who think that their religion one day will be enough when they leave the scene of time behind them and they have to slip out into eternity. But of course, that's not true. When it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to God's salvation, there are some who think they're good enough for heaven, but they're not quite sure. There are some who look at themselves, they depend on their own good works, and they don't realize that no matter how good they might be, they are not good enough to enter into heaven. There are some who are steeped in their own religion depending on a church or a creed. And they believe passionately that what they do in their church will guarantee them a place in heaven. And that's not true. You see, there are so many people in our province who have been lulled into a sense of security, a false sense of security, I might add. And although they may not admit it, They're standing on the verge of a lost eternity. And they're depending on everything else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So this parable tonight is very, very helpful. It deals with eternal issues and it introduces us to two different men. And these men, of course, were complete opposites. Spiritually, they were two different people. Socially, they were two very different people. But they both came to the temple in order to pray. But how they came and how they prayed and how they left the temple reveals so much about both their character and their conduct. 
They made two very different prayers, and the lessons we can learn from them are of great benefit to us spiritually. So come with me for a moment here and quickly. First of all, note the conduct of the Pharisee. Those of you who are familiar with the New Testament will know that the Pharisees in Jesus' day held a position of great power and authority within a group that we refer to as the Sanhedrin. We know from our reading of the various gospel accounts, they were a group of people who were always in conflict with the Lord Jesus Christ. They followed him everywhere. Whatever he was teaching, or even when he was performing a miracle and reaching out to those who were poor and destitute, they were standing there waiting and watching to see if they could somehow catch the Lord Jesus Christ out. They were there, of course, to accuse him when he preached, trying to undermine the impact of the ministry that he had amongst the common folk who came in their droves to listen to the greatest preacher who has ever lived. And it may be that as Jesus relates this parable, he had a particular group of Pharisees on his mind. Because if there was anybody who trusted in themselves, it was certainly the Pharisees. They were a group with a very high opinion of themselves. And what Jesus said in this parable was vitally important to them but it's also vitally important to us. Look at the conduct of this Pharisee for a moment. Let me note a few things with you quickly. First of all, we can see this man's character. He's a Pharisee. He clearly, Jesus identifies him as such, and immediately we know something of the type of character that he was. He was a member of an elite group of people. They were the spiritual elite of their day. They set the trends. They were recognized as the religious leaders. They imposed rules and regulations on people that they couldn't even keep themselves. They emphasized the need for obedience to the law of God, and they were guilty of breaking it in so many different ways. They had an outward appearance that was impressive, but they marched around the city in their long flowing robes, And they were nothing more than a bunch of pious hypocrites. Externally, they seemed to be so religious and so good. But when they themselves and their teaching were examined, they were exposed. And that's made very clear, by the way, that this Pharisee comes into the temple. He came for a time of private prayer. His prayers were anything but private. He came with a proud spirit, and instead of coming to praise God and ask for mercy and forgiveness, this man came to tell God how good he was. He was filled with praise, but his praise was praise that he only heaped upon himself. I always remember all over the years, one commentator who put it like this, when this man came into the temple, he glanced at God and he contemplated himself. This man was a hypocrite. He was going through the motions with God. He was comparing himself to others. And on this occasion, it was a poor publican who in the eyes of the Pharisee was certainly not as good as he was. But sadly, this Pharisee didn't see his own state in the sight of God. You see, beloved, let me say this. Sometimes in life we look at people and we compare ourselves with people. And the world do that outside when it comes to the gospel You speak about a neighbor, oh, I know him. I wouldn't like to be like him. He's the biggest hypocrite in the country. Or they meet somebody that they're working with and they say, oh, well, you know, he's not too bad, Christian, I'm not sure, but I'm just every bit as good as him. And you know, sometimes we look at people and we draw the conclusion that if we are as good as them or we live as good as they live, then somehow that makes us right. But you and I should never, 
You and I should never, ever look at others and look at them and judge them and then make our own decision as to whether we're right or not, depending on that person. You and I should test ourselves in the light of God's Word. You and I should let the Spirit of God look deep within our hearts to reveal the kind of people that we really are. You see, when we stand before God, and God looks into the inner recesses of our hearts and lives, that's how we need to view the standards by which we live. What does the Bible say about you and me? Well, it tells us that we're all born in sin. That's something that we share. We're all shaped in iniquity. It tells us that not only are we sinners in the sight of God, but that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Is that how you see your heart tonight? Is that how I see mine? You see, how we see ourselves in the sight of God and in the light of God's Word, it's all important. And this Pharisee didn't see that. He just judged himself by others, how they lived. And on this occasion, a poor publican who entered into the temple. This man's character, we can see this man's claim. Listen to him just for a moment as he stands before God and he boasts about the qualities in his own life. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, it has to be said in defense of this man, he had many good things in his life that were commendable and good. And this man was no hypocrite because he was telling the truth. He was a Pharisee. He would have had times of prayer. It would have been a daily exercise every day to be found in the temple praying. He would have fasted at certain times of the day. He would have given tithes of all that he had to God. This man was sincere, but this man was sincerely wrong. He was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. He had an outward form of religion, but that's all he had. He worshipped God with his lips, but this man's heart was far from him. We can see this man's character, this man's claim, and we can see this man's contentment. When he had made this glorious speech about himself and his own qualities, he left the temple full of pride. But in reality, his time of prayer had been a wasted exercise. No humility. No understanding of his own life. No understanding of who God is and how holy God is and what it is that God depends from the individual or desires from the individual. This man was so smug. He left the temple looking at the poor publican who had come to pray. And you know what he felt? He is a real sinner. Lord, I'm glad I'm not like the extortioners. I'm not like adulterers. I'm not like this, that, or the other thing because here's me and I'm the man. And he was so full of himself when he had done his business with God, he left contented, justified with himself and not realizing he was still a sinner in the sight of God. You see, here's the thing. This man didn't realize that God sees beyond the external and God sees right into the inner recesses of our heart. This Pharisee was very sincere, but sincerely wrong. And you know the tragedy in the land that is often referred to as a 
a land of great religion. There are so many people religious but don't understand religion cannot save the soul. I remember knocking the doors when I went to Armagh many, many years ago and I went to the store and I looked at the house and I thought, well, there's somebody has a, a bob or two living in a place like this. Man came to the door and I introduced myself and he said to me, oh, welcome to the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland. Oh, yes, there are two main churches. There's fair many other churches and there's many churches in this particular town and right across this province. There's not one of them can save a soul. And this one's exactly the same. If you come to the age of eternity and you stand on the age of eternity and the only thing you can say is I was brought up in Banbridge Baptist Church. It's not enough. And if you say, ah, but, ah, but I came to the meetings in Banbridge Baptist Church, and that's great, but it's not enough. You and I live in the light of eternity. There's no church, no creed, there's no religion that can save us. You say, Pastor, listen, this is not about judging others or criticizing churches. I'd never do that from the pulpit. I never have, and I'll not be doing it tonight. This is about looking at our own lives, honestly, individually, accepting what we are in God's sight and about meeting with God on his terms. None of us can ever hope to be in heaven on the basis of who we are or on the basis of what we have done. We can only be in heaven on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. Jesus Christ came into our world to save sinners. And the only way that those sinners could be saved It meant that the Lord Jesus Christ would go to Golgotha's hillside and there on a cross he would die the sinner's death and bear the sinner's sin in his own body on that tree. And the work that Jesus did is a finished work and it's enough. And God says, listen, you can work all your life for salvation. You don't need to. The work is done. I'm satisfied. Don't depend on your work. Stand on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. For that's the only way that you and I will get to heaven. The hymn says it like this, no other hope, no other plea. He took my place and died for me. O precious Lamb of Calvary, he took my place and died for me. Do we know that tonight from personal experience? Have we put our faith in him who died that we might live and who lives tonight that we need never die? The conduct of the Pharisee looks secondly at the conduct of of the publican. The Pharisee wasn't the only one in the temple that day, for even as he prayed, a publican joined him, a man who was deeply resented by so many people in society. But this poor man, this publican, was so different both in attitude and action when he entered into the temple. He wasted no time in talking to God and seeking his mercy. His prayer was sincere and from the heart. And what a prayer it was, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you know, with all its simplicity, that's the prayer we all need to make, wherever to be saved. He acknowledged his sin. You have to say that this publican was a most unlikely candidate for such a spiritual exercise. He was a tax collector, 
Many of the tax collectors were dishonest men. They took far more money from the people than they needed to do, and that's why these publicans were hated by almost everyone. And this publican is in the temple, and he's praying to God. The first step he takes is the most important step of all, for he acknowledges his sin before God, He accepts what he is in God's sight and he confesses that sin to God. Simple though it might seem, that's the first step any one of us will take on the pathway to embracing God's salvation. Accepting that we are a sinner, acknowledging that sin before God, confessing it and going away from that sin. It's called repentance, turning from it and living a life for the glory of God. See, sometimes we overcomplicate things when it comes to the gospel. Sometimes people don't understand what we say and how we say it. This man's a great example to take with you when you talk to people about their need of salvation. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He acknowledged his sin. He turned to God. He turned to God. You'll note the publican, having heard his prayer, didn't turn around to the man who was leaving the temple and say, excuse me, Mr. Pharisee, could I speak with you just for a moment? For I know that you're one of the religious leaders of our day. I I know that you're held in high esteem here in this land in which we live. I know you. You know the law inside out. No, he didn't do that. He didn't look to this Pharisee because the Pharisee couldn't help him. If he was a sinner and separated from God, God alone could deal with his problem. God alone could restore this man to himself. And he turned to God. The Pharisee could do nothing, absolutely nothing, to save him. Do you know what might seem a very simplistic thing to say, but it needs to be said, and it needs to be understood. If you want your sins forgiven, you need to turn to God. God alone can save us from our sins. If we're serious about salvation, we turn to God. Because it is God who can deal with our sin problem. And he does that, I have already said tonight, he does it on the basis of his son's death on the cross at Calvary. Out of a great heart of love. And on that cruel cross at Calvary, God delivered up his son for us all. Why would he do such a thing? because there was no other way that we could be saved. There was no other way that our sin could be dealt with. It took the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, one who had no sin and who knew no sin, to take the sinner's place. We can try to do better and become more respectable, Or we can go more often to church and involve ourselves in religious exercises to become more religious. But if it's forgiveness we want, we'll have to turn to God. And we'll have to come and bow at the foot of an old rugged cross and put our trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Now, if we don't meet God on those terms, 
And if we think we will get to heaven our own way, then we are greatly mistaken because if we don't come by way of the cross, then we cannot come at all. He acknowledged his sin. He turned to God and he asked for mercy. He asked for mercy. What a different prayer this is. From the Pharisee who paraded in and told God immediately, look at me. Look what I've done. Look at this. Look at that. And then he turned around. He said, I'm glad I'm not like that man. And he went out brazenly from the temple believing he was a great man in town. See the publican? He walked in. He couldn't even lift his head toward heaven. This man stood and he was so ashamed of himself and so ashamed of his sin. He bowed his head and with great intensity, he beat on his breast. And he was concerned so much for himself. No fancy words. No pious platitudes. God be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. He knew he was guilty, and he pleads for mercy. And with a humble, contrite heart, he realized apart from the mercy of God, he had no other hope. We can be absolutely sure of this tonight. That anyone who looks to God humbly for mercy shall surely find it. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God tonight is willing to extend mercy to those who come seeking it believing it's the only hope they have, realizing they're a sinner and without the mercy of God, without faith in Jesus Christ, they cannot ever be saved. Do you know what's amazing about this? You and I deserve nothing from the hand of God. Absolutely nothing. He has every right to banish each one of us out into a Christless hell. But such is his love, such is his mercy, and such is his grace that if we throw ourselves tonight on that mercy and seek his forgiveness, here's what the Word of God says about our sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far will he remove our transgressions from us. Friend, this is a very important parable. We can go home tonight or sit at home tonight like the Pharisee, smug in our sin, content with our own self-righteousness, glad that we're not like the man down the road who professes to be a Christian. And we can remain in our sin and far from God. Or we can do as the publican did. Acknowledge our sin. Turn to God. And throw ourselves on his mercy. And if we put our trust in Jesus Christ and rest our all in his finished work at Calvary, we can have the assurance that all our sins will be forgiven. Maybe you need to pray tonight as you leave the meeting. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless. Look to thee for grace. 
Fall I do not find and fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. We'll all die. But it's whether we die in Christ or without him will make the difference in eternity. Let's sing that hymn I've quoted from as we close tonight. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. What a wonderful opportunity tonight to be cleansed from our sin. Let's stand and sing. <coughs> take your word tonight, make it real, relevant, and personal to each one of us, both in the building and those who join us on Facebook Live. Father, we pray that there will come that time, if it hasn't already taken place, when we will come as that public and despised who he was did. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Thank you that many of us know that our sins have all been forgiven for Jesus' sake. For those who don't, may they take this step of faith. May they turn to God. May they cry for mercy and know forgiveness for all their sins. Part us with your blessing. Remember the young people as they meet tonight and take each one of us to our homes in safety. We ask it all for the glory and honor and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.